Studies Section 8, The Metaphysics of John Locke, The Reality Behind the Appearance, Introduction. Like other empiricists of the modern period, John Locke did not draw a clear distinction between his empiricism and his metaphysics. However, it is possible to draw some conclusions concerning the nature of reality from the representation of his epistemological project. Locke believed that his task in philosophy was to clear the underbush of debris and rubbish that are found on the way to genuine knowledge. This underbush is innate ideas. To this extent, Locke had a clear perception concerning the nature of reality. Reality for him consists in ideas derivable from the sense only. The external world therefore exists, but as ideas, sensations, or sense data. It is from this thesis that his basic metaphysical stance, which is where he opposed the possibility of innate ideas, can be drawn. His arguments are represented in what follows in the present lecture. In this study section, you will be learning about the metaphysical theory of idealism side by side, the empirical theory empiricism of John Locke. Furthermore, you will be learning about innate, simple, and complex ideas. Learning outcomes for study section eight. When you have studied this section, you should be able to discuss the metaphysical theory of idealism side by side, the empirical theory empiricism of John Locke, explain the innate ideas, briefly explain the complex ideas, the metaphysical theory of idealism. John Locke did not espouse any distinct metaphysics. He presented everything in and out of his theory of knowledge. However, in addition to discussing how you know, he is interested in the reality of what you know. He has given you a theory of how you arrive at all the ideas that you have. And so, when you have experienced the idea of what instance, redness, roundness, crunchiness, and sweetness all together, you apply to this collection of experiences the label hapu. But something here needs to be explained. Why do these sort of experiences always occur to us in the clusters? If they are distinct sensations, why are they never separate and free floating? You do not perceive sweetness standing alone by itself. You always experience a sweet something, whether it is an apple, a lump of sugar, or a candy bar. Locke says you need the idea of substance. Definition of substance. Substance literally means that which stands under. The substance of the apple then is a reality in which the qualities that produce our experiences of redness, roundness, and crunchiness in here. The problem is that you cannot have knowledge of this reality itself, for you have direct experience only of the ideas it supports. The issue of the nature of substance has been a matter of controversy since the first publication of the essay. The primary stroke secondary quality distinction provides you with certain ways in understanding physical objects. But Locke is puzzled about what underlies or supports the primary qualities themselves. He is also puzzled about what material and immaterial substances might have in common that will lead us to apply the same word to both. These kinds of reflections led him to the relative and obscure idea of substance in general. You experience properties appearing in regular clumps, but you must infer that there is something that supports or perhaps holds together those qualities. It is quite clear that Locke sees no alternative to the claim that there are substances supporting qualities. He does not, for example, have a theory of troops. Troops 
are properties that can exist independently of substances, which he might use to dispense with the notion of substance. In fact, he may be rejecting something like a theory of tropes when he rejects the Aristotelian doctrine of real qualities and insists on the need for substances. In his thoughts not at all is skeptic about substance in the way that Hume is, but it is also quite clear that he is regularly insistent about the limitations of our ideas of substances. Since Berkeley, Locke's doctrine of the substratum or substance in general has been attacked as incoherent. It seems to imply that you have a particular without any properties and this seems like a notion that is inconsistent with empiricism. You have no experience of such an entity and so no way to derive such an idea from experience. Locke himself acknowledges this point. In order to avoid this problem, Michael Ayers has proposed that you must understand the notions of substratum and substance in general in terms of Locke's doctrine of real essences developed in Book 3 of the essay rather than as a separate problem from that of knowing real essences. The real essence of a material thing is its atomic constitution. This atomic constitution is the causal basis of all the observable properties of the thing. Were the real essence known, all the observable properties could be deduced from it. Locke claims that the real essences of material things are quite unknown to us. Locke's concept of substance in general is also a something I know not what. Thus, on Ayer's interpretation, substance in general means something like whatever it is that supports qualities, while the real essence means this particular atomic constitution that explains this set of observable qualities. Thus, Ayer's wants to treat the unknown substratum as picking out the same thing as the real essence, thus eliminating the need for particulars without properties. This proposed way of interpreting Locke has been criticized by scholars both because of a lack of textural support and on the stronger grounds that it conflicts with some things that Locke does say. As you have reached one of the important concepts in Book 3, let us turn to that book and Locke's discussion of language. Furthermore, it is argued that Locke is too committed to common sense to deny that something out there underlies our ideas. However, the notion of substance is clearly a problem for his position and undermines the rigor of his empiricism. As it can be said, since you do not experience substances, what are they like? And how can you be sure they are there? In response, Locke suggests that if someone were asked these questions, he could only say that substance was something he knows not what and that it was the supposed but unknown support of those qualities you find existing. Locke seems to use our limited knowledge of material substances in a subtle and unusual way to support his religious outlook. Typically, the religious skeptic says you can be certain matter exists, but you have no evidence for any spiritual realities. Actually, Locke says our idea of spiritual substance is just as clear and well-founded as our idea of physical substance. After all, you never encounter material substance themselves, only the qualities that inhere within them. In the same way, through reflection, Locke says, he encounters his mental activities which he must suppose inhere within some spiritual substances just as he supposed there is material substance underlying what he perceived. Thus, you have as many and as clear ideas belonging to spirit 
as we have belonging to body, the substance of each being equally unknown to us. Thus for Locke, just as it is reasonable to assume there is matter, so it is reasonable to assume there are spiritual substances. Broadly examined, Locke's metaphysics was similar to Descartes. Since Locke believes in both physical and spiritual substances, as well as holding to an interactionist theory of the mind-body relationship. What does essence mean to Ayers? Essence to Ayers means this particular atomic constitution that explains this set of observable qualities. Innate ideas. As with Francis Bacon and René Descartes before him, Lost Mission can be viewed as a kind of urban renewal project. His first project was to clear away the debris of unintelligible terms and useless stems of thought. Only then could he make a fresh start on more modern construction. His modest goal as a philosopher was to be employed as an under-laborer in clearing the ground and removing some of the rubbish that lie in the way of knowledge. The rubbish he most wanted to sweep away was the doctrine of innate ideas. This doctrine claimed that some kinds of idea, principle, or knowledge are not acquired through experience but are built into the mind itself. This doctrine was a standard thesis in the rationalist position from Plato to Leibniz, but Locke raised a number of fundamental objections to it. For Locke, ideas are not considered as objects of knowledge so much as its building blocks. He says that an idea is anything that is the immediate object of perception, thought, or understanding. He presents a random collection of examples to illustrate what it means by ideas. These include things such as whiteness, hardness, sweetness, thinking, motion, man, elephant, army, drunkenness, and others. Notice that by idea, Locke does not mean only concepts or abstract notions such as justice or infirmity. Ideas can also be the very specific and concrete qualities found in sensation, such as colors, taste, and sounds. Examples of innate ideas. Typical examples of innate ideas are logical principles, such as whatever it is, or it is possible for the same to be and not to be, or the all is greater than the part. Furthermore, both within philosophical traditions and among many of Locke's contemporaries, the claim was made that moral principles as well as the concept of God were in it. It is necessary to point out at this point that a favorite argument for innate ideas is based on the claim that there is universal agreement concerning certain principles. First of all, Locke argues that if even this were true, it would not prove that the ideas were in it. There could be some other reasons why people come to have some ideas in common. For example, all cultures have ideas corresponding to fire, sun, heat, and numbers, but these ideas are universal because human experience are uniform and not because they are in it. Second, Locke point that not all people know the preceding logic principles stated above. Many children, mentally diffident people, and people in pre scientific culture do not exhibit knowledge of this truth. But if these principles really were natural imprint on the mind, everyone will know that you have these ideas. How did Locke see an idea? Locke saw an idea as anything that is the immediate object of perception, thought, or understanding. Simple ideas. If there are no innate ideas or if knowledge does not originate in the mind, how then does it end up in the mind? The answer according to Locke is through experience. 
He asked us to suppose that the mind is like a blank sheet of white paper on which experience makes its marks. You come naked into this world, both physically and mentally. Whatever ideas are found in the mind must have been deposited there by some experience. In another place, John Law compares the mind to dark closet or like the interior of a camera in modern terms. Though the opening of the lens, represented by the various senses, the external world is able to deposit images within the camera. A very important consideration of John Locke's metaphysics is the concept of simple ideas. This comes in two varieties. The first consists of all the ideas that come from sensation, such as the idea you have of qualities such as yellow, white, heat, cold, soft, hard, bitter, and sweet. The second categories of simple ideas are the ideas of reflection gained from our experience of our own mental operations. Complex ideas like the camera film that receives and records the light that enters through its lens so the human mind passively receives ideas through experience. However, these ideas are sounds, color, and other things of sensation. Although the mind cannot originate ideas, Locke holds that it can process them into more complex ideas. For instance, the idea of space can be combined with other perceptions of space to produce an immense space. In the same vein, the idea of sweetness and that of roundness and that of yellow and so on can be combined to produce the idea of apple. Furthermore, you can engage the mind in the production of abstractions, that is, complex ideas of abstractions such as philosophy, life, mathematics and so on. There are also ideas of relations formed as a result of the combination of other simple ideas such as father and son, husband and wife, teacher and student, and so on. All these form the ontology in the Lockean representation of reality. There are other realities such as primary and secondary ideas. What this means is that it is very difficult to separate its epistemology from its metaphysics. As such, in the fourth book of an essay concerning human understanding, Locke tells you what knowledge is and what humans can know and what they cannot, not simply what they do and do not happen to know. Locke defines knowledge as the perception of the connection and agreement or disagreement and repugnancy of any of our ideas. For one, page 525. This definition of knowledge contrasts with the Cartesian definition of knowledge as any ideas that are clear and distinct. Locke's account of knowledge allows him to say that you can know substances in spite of the fact that our ideas of them always include the obscure and relative idea of substance in general. Still, Locke's definition of knowledge raises in this domain a problem analogous to those you have seen with perception and language. If knowledge is the perception of the agreement or disagreement of any of your ideas, are you not trapped in the circle of your own ideas? What about knowing the real existence of things? Locke is plainly aware of this problem and very likely holds that the implausibility of skeptical hypotheses, such as Descartes' dream hypothesis, along with the causal connections between qualities and ideas in his own system is enough to solve the problem. It is also worth noting that there are significant differences between Locke's brand of empiricism and that of Berkeley that would make it easier for Locke to solve the veil of perception problem than Berkeley. Locke, for example, makes transdictive inferences about atoms where Berkeley is unwilling to allow that such inferences are legitimate. This implies that Locke has a semantics that allows him to talk about the unexperienced causes of experience, such as atoms, where Berkeley cannot. 
what then can you know and with what degree of certainty you can know that God exists with the second highest degree of assurance that of demonstration you also know that you exist with the highest degree of certainty the truth of morality and mathematics you can know with certainty as well because these are modal ideas whose adequacy is guaranteed by the fact that you make such ideas as ideal models which other things must fit rather than trying to copy some external archetype which you can only grasp inadequately. On the other hand, your effort to grasp the nature of external objects are limited largely to the connection between their apparent qualities. The real essence of elephants and gold is hidden from hawks. Though, in general, you suppose them to be some distinct combination of atoms which cause the grouping of apparent qualities which leads you to see elephants and violet, gold and silver as distinct kinds. Your knowledge of material things is probabilistic and thus opinion rather than knowledge. Thus our knowledge of external objects is inferior to our knowledge of mathematics and morality of ourselves and of God. Why Locke holds that you only have knowledge of a limited number of things, he thinks you can judge the truth or falsify of many propositions in addition to those you can legitimately claim to know. Did Locke's brand of empiricism agrees with that of Berkeley? No, they saw things differently. Summary of study section 8. In study section 8, you have learned that 1. The metaphysics of John Locke centers on the rejection of innate ideas. As he argued, the doctrine of innate ideas is not sustainable because nothing in reality is not first given to us through the sense and the mind. For Locke, the mind is likened to the dark inner part of the camera and the sense constitutes the lens through which ideas come into in the form of light. To this extent, logical truth, mathematical equivalences, and analytic judgment are handmade of these senses. 2. The idea of substance in Locke's metaphysics, which is the reality that holds together various ideas and yet unperceived by the sense, this however creates a problematic for Locke. This is the end of study section 8. Thanks for listening.